Yeah, we were talking about round trip time, Daniel. Yeah, no. So on the that? internet, the round trip time from Auckland to Boston is 220 milliseconds. Auckland? 220 milliseconds. Yes. And that's primarily because it is not quite the direct path. Right. But that's probably actually a good proxy for the ion sphere path as well. Okay. That's that's longer than I could have imagined. That is round trip. So that's once around the world. Okay. Oh, so the I from Auckland you want to Boston, Boston to Boston now. You can't measure that because internet traffic only goes the shortest path. You can't force a packet to go the long way around from Boston to Boston. You have to pick sure a destination. You, can. you have to you, pick you a You send a packet and wait for it to return. Yeah, but the, what I'm saying is all of the routers in between, they will say, oh, I know where that packet is. I'll oh, send it right back right. to where it this started. This is internet for, round Internet round trip time, yes. Well, it's all the same thing as HF round trip time. That's substantially longer than speed of light. Well, I don't think substantially. It should be, because it's like half speed of light in most of the cables. I shouldn't expect to be substantially Fiber shorter. Half of it. <laughs> Fiber is a valid point. The, no, the propagation in a fiber is like 0.8.9. It's like 0.6c, I thought. No, it's 0.8.9c. Well, we're going to have to go. It exactly isn't 0.9. What do you say for fiber optics? Yeah. yeah. It's the uh, propagation is it 0.6? Okay, thank you. I'm not crazy. I, I was just reading it. Oh, okay. Yeah. On the order of one. <laughs> okay. Well, is there a, is there a microphone for the live stream? Or we do? Um, this one seems to be pretty good catching everything at the front okay. of the room, so that works. So, if you want to mostly be out here, we can move it out to here. But that's part. This okay. usually works pretty good. Okay. Good. Good. All right. We can give it a couple more minutes, or we can start now. What do we think? Let's get started. Okay. Let me make sure the camera's on. Okay. It's on us? Yep. Okay. Well, hi all. Thank you for coming and welcome to the last lecture in our series of SIAP. Um, today, jo Dr. Joel Dawson is here to talk about his experiences in wireless industry with edit devices, 5G, and sort of how things work and where everything's going. Um, Dr. Dawson got his start working with Tinkering with Electronics and Amateur Radio, came to MIT for his bachelor's and master's degree, and got a PhD in electrical engineering at Stanford, eventually came back and joined the ECS faculty here at MIT, and then went off and, based on his research here, founded a company called Edda Devices, which works on high-efficiency amplifier technologies for cellular communications. Um, Dr. Dawson has since received the um, NSF Early Career Award in 2008 and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2009. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Joel Dawson. Right, thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, it, it, yeah, thanks for welcoming me here. I'm uh, glad to speak to uh, uh, kind of the, the amateur radio you know, club. How, how many people here you know, kind of actually do amateur radio? I mean, actually, so, you know, two, but, uh, yeah. I, uh, I, at, when I was in high school, I think I got my technician class license. I didn't do a lot with it, uh, but I was N4WEB, uh, and at that time, uh, it was the last few years where you still had to learn Morse code, so that was, uh, that was quite an adventure. You know, you used to have, uh, uh, you guys are probably too young to remember this, but I bought an you know, audio tape to practice, you know, the yeah, GDD where you're trying to kind of figure it out. Um, and, uh, but it, it, you know, in general, I was just fascinated by, um, I was just fascinated by radio, you know, and uh, one of the things that I like to do you know, when I'm kind of talking to, you know, more general audiences, um, and especially you guys, because you're into it now. It's not, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, not, not just casual observers, like you really think about this stuff. I uh, was so to step back and remember that the reason, one of the reasons that, that radio is amazing, you know, is that it is completely not intuitive okay? You've never seen a radio wave, never felt it, never smelled it, Never heard it? Nothing. 
You have experience with other types of waves, you know, water and acoustic waves, but those all have a medium. You know, electromagnetic waves have no medium. A lot of physicists spent a lot of time trying to find it and they couldn't. That is messed up. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, basically when, when we're talking about you know, sort of all of electromagnetism and you know, uh, you know, amateur radio is an application of, of electromagnetism. This is basically action at a distance. I do something here and it affects something on the other side of the planet. If you didn't know the answer, you would think that that's, you might argue that that's not possible. It feels like magic, it is magic. And the only reason that we forget that it's magic is that we have mathematics we can put around it. That makes us feel smart, look smart, and it's just sort of generally a good time. <laughs> You know, Maxwell's equations, you can do all these things, wave equations, you know, dispersion, you know, what is the, uh, the dielectric constant of kind of whatever, I mean, all of that, you know, that's, that's, you need to understand all of that. But at the end of the day, you could argue this sort of emotionally dealing with the fact that we're doing something that's very creepy. Now, it's a consistent creepy, it follows certain creepy rules all the time. And we can sort of, you know, use that pattern to build machines that do interesting things. So just try not to try not to forget that, you know, as you're kind of going, you know, kind of going through, and you kind of whatever, whatever you do. And, and a lot of science is like that. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a electromagnetism is kind of an easy target because it's just so, you know, you can't kind of see anything, and, and uh, you know. But if you look at, um, thank you. You know, if you think about, uh, you know, kind of the things that our uh, mechanical engineering brethren kind of use all the time, well, gravity, well, that's another one of those creepy things, right? You know, big planets, you know, kind of spaced out, you know, again, nothing to kind of tether them, and yet they, you know, form kind of these stable orbits, and not just two bodies, you know, but ten, you know. Wow, the world's an amazing place, you know, and uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is one of the things that was interesting to me about radio. Also, I just liked electronics. I like, you know, you, you, open, you open up the box, you see all these components, you wonder what they're all for, you know, you know, what kind of mind would know, like, why that capacitor is there, and why it should be 10 microfarads, what is that? What are those secrets, right? So by the time I came to MIT, I was really, you know, primed to just like, I, I would do all the Laplace transforms in the world, you just tell me how, to, how this stuff works, you know? Um, and so, you know, radio has had kind of a big influence on me. Um, so I am, uh, this hour is yours. Uh, I understand, you know, especially because we have a small crowd, we can take uh, questions and discussions. I have, you know, kind of material to kind of go through that I think you will be interested in. But if I am wrong, we can do something else. Um, you know, the, there is a, there's been a lot of attention, there's a, a, you know, these last couple of decades on startup companies, uh, you know, Ada Devices. Uh, is my second startup company. When I finished graduate school, uh, we started a company, um, and then I came to MIT. Uh, you joined the faculty, and then we started started data devices. So I've had some experience with the whole VC thing, and, and you know everybody crammed in a submarine, desperate to survive on a startup <coughs> company. That's that's kind of what's you know happening there. Um, so I, I will tell you about that. Uh, you know, I also I talked to Daniel. I understand that there is um, interest in 5G. You know, what's that? All, what is that all about? You know, um, and uh, you know, happy to talk about that. You know, the, the, the preview is that you basically have all the concepts that you need right now to kind of understand with 5G. The difference between 5G and what you guys do is a matter of priority. Okay, 5G. The problem that 5G is trying to solve and 4G before that is to send the maximum number of bits per second subject to the constraint of a limited amount of spectrum. That's the basics. Everything else is just details. Interesting details. But we'll kind of get to that. Okay. So I, I uh, you know, this, is, this is the end of device story. The, the, the first piece of any device is what does that name, what does that mean? It turns out to be a branding disaster. ETA, ETA should it be all caps, you know, what is that? You know, ETA, if you go to Spain, you know, it is a terrorist organization, which is really unfortunate <laughs> because when you go to the Mobile World Congress, which is in Barcelona every year, you come in your ADA devices, it gets people very concerned. Okay? So, if I do all again, maybe do something different. The reason we took ADA devices is that in engineering physics, we were doing high efficiency RF lineups, 
Eta is the Greek letter for efficiency, so we ran with it. Analog <coughs> devices is big around here. We needed something devices, so we went with Eta devices. That's the story. Um, and uh, I, uh, the particular problem uh, that you know, we wind up you know, kind of going after. I'll talk about some, some details of technology too, but the, the, the basic uh, the trade-off that got my attention when I was maybe a couple years beyond your shoes when I was in graduate school was that when you look at the science of radio, kind of the physics of radio, one of the trade-offs that kind of, you know, kind of starts to get in your, your brain a little bit uh, is there seems to be this fundamental trade-off between energy efficiency in the RF lineup and basically information capacity, how many bits you can send. Okay, now what I mean by that is that you know, with, the, with the RF lineup on the transmitter side is unusual in electronics because you're actually concerned with energy, right? What's going out of the antenna is E cross B pointing flux, honest to goodness watts, okay? Normally with electronics, you wind up consuming energy, it's just incidental. Right, you know, you're, what you're really trying to do is do some sort of computation or kind of get information. And because there's capacitance in the world that has to be charged and discharged, you wind up consuming energy, but it's incidental, it's parasitic. You know, in a, uh, uh, but in a radio transmitter, we talk about efficiency. What we are interested in is how much energy do we take out of the power supply and how much of that energy winds up going out over the antenna. A 100% efficient RF lineup takes 40 watts out of, the out of the power supply, puts 40 watts out of the antenna, and never heats up. Yeah, that's important. So you start to think about that. It's like, well, you know, why would there be a trade-off between energy consumption and all these metrics that ultimately equate to capa and information capacity? That's not intuitive. Maybe there is no trade-off. Maybe we just haven't been, we haven't been clever enough about our architecture. And that is kind of how I got rolling into this when I joined the faculty at MIT. What is that? Is there really a nature's trade-off between these things, or you know, can we be more clever about our system? Between 1998 and 2007, a lot of stuff happened. And uh, I went to a talk by Dave Peralt, you know, who is in Lee's, you know, and is probably the most knowledgeable person in the world on power management. Really big time. Okay, so he's giving a talk on a, uh, you know, some sort of switching power converter that, that does all of these things. He's, he's trying to get, make it efficient, trying to make it small, kind of all this stuff. And then he makes this throwaway comment that I'll never forget, which is that, you know, wow, it also has something called a really high modulation bandwidth. I have no idea what you would do with that, but I'm just gonna put that out there. And you know, I'm sitting in the back of the hall, and I jump like, "Why? Well, I know exactly what you would do with that. This is this is a big problem, you know, for you know RF power amplifier lineups. Basically, if you want to, you know, modulate the supply and do it quickly, how can you do it efficiently? That that is like the thing. So you know, uh, you know, we went to lunch and we started talking about it, and um, you know, he was throwing out some ideas about, you know, well, you know, Joel, if we could, if we could, uh, uh, you know, think about. Here's, if we could simplify the power management you know, in kind of the, the following ways, I could make it really fast and really efficient. And then you know, how, how can you make a, a valid data? That's how this kind of all started. You know? and, uh, and then there was just a, a bunch of really fortunate you know, accidents. Right? We, we, we sat down, we needed to get some money to fund this. We'd apply to the Desponde Center. The Desponde Center was connected to Sloan. Uh, Sloan you know, had a, a Matthias Ostrom, he was a, a, a Sloan fellow. A Sloan fellow is somebody who just sold a company as taking a victory lap in business school. Right, that's what he was doing, uh, looking for his next opportunity. Um, you know, he brought in a, a you know guy named Mark Briffa, uh, you know, who was this uh, 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 kind of this Australian guy, you know, very interesting. I had read his papers in graduate school. You know, small world, um, and we we, we ought to kind of uh, uh, putting ourselves together you know, and. and thinking that you know, we had a technology, and more important for a startup company, there's a market for it. So what can we do? Uh, we wound up needing to raise venture capital. Uh, those of you who are thinking about starting a company, uh, raising venture capital is not a no-brainer. It's not automatic. If you can avoid it, think about it. But we needed it. Hardware is expensive. And uh, you know, fortunately for us, 
Ray Stata, you know, was still in the venture capital business. I'm not sure if he's doing new investments now, but he was, you know, uh, he, he was at the time. And, and no other venture capital uh, company would touch this. You know, at, you know, at the time, this was uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, people have been burned by hardware companies so many times, you know, we don't even know how to spell FPGA. <laughs> you know, bring us a social media app and that's what we're going to do. You know, uh, show us how we can get 100 million teenagers in Japan to use your stuff. All right. Uh, but Ray, you know, wanted to, you know, was willing to fund this and that was one, the first of many, many breaks that went our way in order to get the company off the ground. Um, and uh, so, you know, ultimately what I wound up doing was leaving the MIT faculty. Uh, you know, there was, a, there was a period there of about a year where I was kind of taking meetings, you know, as a faculty member and doing, uh, but, you know, it, it, a startup company is, is just kind of an all-consuming thing, you know, and, and even, even more important, when you're recruiting people to be in your startup company, you are pitching them on having an impact on the world. Right, and then how can you then have them come up, take lower salaries, you know, for stock options, and then you're kind of back hedging back. Okay, you know, it's, it doesn't always have to be that way, but I felt like you know, for me as a founding CTO, uh, you know, it was kind of the right thing. A um, lot of stuff happened between <coughs> 2011 and uh, 2016, uh, but we wound up getting acquired by Nokia. And Nokia's interest in this, Nokia is one of the leading base station manufacturers in the world. And uh, you know, now I am leading a team within Nokia to deploy the technology. You know, so uh, you know, I am happy to say that, you know, in, and I remind myself sometimes that because it gets very stressful and very aggravating and there's all these things that sort of go on, but you know, what I remind myself is that this is actually, if you're, you know, when I was you know, deciding to be an engineer, this is kind of a dream come true. Like, this is what I would have imagined myself doing, right? You, you, you see a technology early, you know, that, that uh, and you, know, you get a team, you know, and you, you, you put it together and it actually delivers like what you thought it was going to deliver. You know, amazing, you know. And then maybe if we, uh, you know, succeed in deploying this, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, this will be the way that high performance radio transmitters are designed. No brainer. Of course you would do this. Why would you do anything else? That is, uh, so, you're hearing my internal dialogue here to <laughs> motivate myself what I'm dealing with, you know, some lawyer you know, that's making my life difficult, or, you know, HR person who is obsessing over headcount, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes on. But that, that's basically the arc, you know, kind of of the company, and, you know, happy to take questions about that, especially if you are, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, taking a step like that yourself. Okay, we are at MIT. We talk about technology. What is the technology here? Okay. Um, as amateur radio operators, you probably will not have thought too much about you know, power consumption. Because for very good reasons, you do not care. Right? You know, you're not trying to carry your you know, ham radio rig around in your pocket. You know? Um, and uh, you know the the, the uh, and you don't you don't you, know, you don't care that it needs to run run by a battery. So you're not worried about battery life. You're not worried about heat dissipation. That's when you would that's when you would care. You're you're happy, and you're only building one, right? You only need to get one working. You only need to get a million working. I said those these are the reasons why uh, you sort of casually observe that the box is getting awfully hot, you know, and on a really bad day melts or blows up, <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody's done a lot of experiments. <laughs> but, you know, it's, re it's really kind of an academic interest. But, you know, it, when, it, when it comes to, you know, consumer electronics, and when it comes to maintaining a cellular network, you know, Sprint, AT&T, Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, their biggest operating expense is paying for electricity for their base stations. And the biggest consumer of electricity for those base stations is actually this primitive power amplifier that pushes stuff out over the antenna. Okay. You know, uh, the, it, you know, in the iPhone, this was such a problem in the iPhone that even Steve Jobs knew about this. You know, we went to, uh, we went to uh, you know, try to raise money from a venture capital firm called Kleiner Perkins. They were at, you know, up until very, very recently, you know, they were the big, you know, one of the biggest, you know, venture capital, most prestigious venture capital 
you know, companies in Silicon Valley. We did not get funded, much to our bitter disappointment. You know, but you know, at the time, uh, and you, they were in the news. Uh, you know, kind of a couple years later, uh, this, uh, this Asian woman who had the uh, the sexual um, misconduct, you know, kind of you know, suit against against a big VC firm that was Kleiner Perkins. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the time, uh, Bill Joy, you know, was one of their investors, and Bill Joy, you know, founder of Sun, you know, I think he wrote um, not Emacs. What's the other one? V. Um, V, yeah. Um, VI. VI, thank you. Yeah, bro, VI like in like a, a weekend. So, you know, you, you go in and you talk to Bill Joy. You know, he's, he's looking at like you know, looking at your stuff and he, you know, he leans back and says, Yeah, you know, I was talking to Steve. And he said, you know, Bill, you've got to figure out a solution to this PA problem. He's like Steve Jobs, like, wow, you know, you just really it's really it's the Silicon Valley moment. Uh, and you know, uh, Steve Jobs cares about this again, not because he's interested in the efficiency of power amplifiers, but because when you're dissipating a lot of heat, it limits how small you can make your devices. And Steve Jobs loved small, sexy devices, so anything that got in the way of that is a problem. Also, uh, the PA is a dominant power consumer, uh, and that, that affects your battery life. You know, so if you, if you look at you know in your uh, your smartphone now. You know, when you turn on navigation, you're maintaining this wireless link that's constantly helping you to know where you are. That wireless link, you know, requires a lot of power, and this is so. So you've experienced this. The um, the other thing, and, and pay attention here because this is uh, this is we're going to come back to this when we talk about the problems of 5G and what makes 5G difficult. If you were to do this, is a little bit of an old school, you know, kind of Apple, Apple Wi-Fi router. Uh, but if you open it up, you know, what do you see? You see electronics, to be sure, but you also see heat sinks. Heat sinks. Okay. Now, if your electronics was perfectly efficient, I guess what I mean here is you know the, the, the RF power amplifier. There would be no heat to dissipate. Everything that you took out of the power supply winds up going out usefully over the antenna and you're good. Now, there are sort of microprocessors and things like that that also dissipate heat, but, but, but you, know, you, you get the idea. Uh, and you really want to kind of look at this picture and start to let it change your mindset a little bit. It's like, okay. Um, <coughs> you can do almost anything if you throw enough energy at the problem. You can do almost anything. But the price that you pay for that inefficiency you know, is heat dissipation, and that winds up showing up as heat management, which shows up as weight, it shows up as cost, and it shows up as size. This is another one of those sort of truths of engineering that, that's kind of very weird to me. Uh, you can improve almost any metric that you can name by throwing energy at the problem. There is a reason a Lamborghini has very poor, poor gas mileage. Uh, if you think about you know, kind of building a clock you know, that is you know, you know, accurate to an atomic, atomic clock, you can't wear an atomic clock. <laughs> you know? It's big. You know, when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, you know, for the first time, you know, the reigning kind of world champion, one of the best chess players that ever lived. You know, at the time, that was not a, a small thing. It, it required lots and lots of energy. Almost anything that you can think of. You know, phase noise and oscillators, you know, winds up, you know, being reduced if you burn more power. Uh, in electronics guys, so there's a lot of sort of examples. You know, a bigger gain bandwidth product, you know, in your op amps. Uh, Surely I can come with a mechanical example here. Um, Timekeeping, gas mileage, acceleration. Um, something to meditate on, something to really internalize early in your engineering careers. In general, many times we know how to get a specific functionality. The challenge is how can you use, how can you make it in, uh, economical enough to be, able to be practical? All right, so that is uh, that is uh, you know kind of the, the the backstory to Ada devices, and that is you know we sort of do a little meditation here on you know basic engineering truths. 
Uh, how many people have heard of 5G? Okay, big deal. Any thoughts as to what 5G is? Curious. No thoughts. Ties a, well, you work over a lot of different frequencies simultaneously, a lot of little sort of micro frequency bands. Okay, right? work over a lot of different frequency bands simultaneously. Just move around in real time, so. Okay. I have personal doubts as to how reliable that will be. But. Okay, all right. Move around in real time. Another way of saying that is low latency networks. Doubts about how reliable that is. Those doubts are well founded, but that's one thing. So I'm going to expand those comments a little bit. Okay, so the the the, the, the very fast networks, you know, low latency, uh, but also kind of you know working on a lot of frequencies at the same time is a kind of a good proxy for lots of bits per second, very high capacity. Okay. Any other? Things that you've heard, you don't have to be correct, but you know, the things that you've heard, go ahead, Dan. Well, I, I've also heard a lot of things about like beam steering plans. Yeah, beam steering, beam Mimo. steering. <clears throat> MIMO, that's a big one. Any other? Yeah. I think it's higher frequency than the other current cell bands. Yes, people talk about using millimeter waves, like 28 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz. That's another aspect, good, you guys are. Very well informed. There's a lot of people who think it's going to be the new home broadband option. Home broadband because of the really high capacity, I'm sure. Any other? Yeah. I've heard some concerns about like health risks. Health risks. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's like fringe or. Well, okay. I'm going to take that one first because uh, you know I think about it too, and I think it's kind of funny, and I think it's kind of true. Okay, so 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 um, you know uh, if you think about you know kind of the MIMO piece, all right, and you imagine, and by MIMO, massive MIMO, what they mean is like uh, uh, we'll talk about what this means, but but you know 64 or 128 transmitters in parallel, okay, and then they'll say something like yeah, and I want five or ten watts, you know, per pipe times 128. Okay, so that's a lot of power, you know, and then beam steering. Okay, so now we're going to put that all in one beam. I mean, that's, that's a death ray. <laughs> okay. I don't think that they really intended, but that, 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 that's one kind of, I mean, if you, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, and, you know, don't, don't, uh, with 5G, for now, never assume that the person you're talking to has a very clear idea of how this is all going to play out. A reasonable description of 5G right now is that every idea that anybody has ever had about a network all rolled into one. Okay. And then we're just going to put it out there, you know, and uh, you know, uh, make things as software defined as we can, and then when we figure it out, we'll be able to we'll be able to configure it. Okay. You, you forgot one. Yeah. If your AT and T is just marketing. Okay. What was that? He said, if, if your at and is just marketing. In fairness, though, it's not just at and You know, uh, one, one uh, uh, companies are under a lot of pressure right now to be the first or early in 5G. And one way to do that is to take a transmitter that you already have, implement one 5G feature, and call it 5G. <laughs> okay. Um, it's kind of a serious game. You, know, you, 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 you sit that out, and then you know, your investors wonder why you don't have anything on 5G. So you know, you know, we're, we're too serious to play these marketing games. Your share price plummets. You know, your, your CEO. I mean, a lot goes on in business. Just prepare yourself. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, uh, you know, on, on the low on the low latency network you know, kind of side of things. You know, it, it's. Um, you know, people talk about these sort of dream applications, like these self-driving cars. You know, you kind of, you know, that that's one reason to have kind of a low latency network. Um, you know, apparently, uh, the people that are dreaming that up never saw Terminator or The Matrix. You know, <laughs> you think you've seen cybersecurity threats now? Imagine if they could control, you know, two and a half ton vehicles. You know, as those ballistic missiles. Um, I don't know. Hopefully, we'll sort it all out. Don't forget about space weather interfering with GPS. Right. Crazy, um, but you know, I, I think that the, uh, the, the the main thing uh, that you know, one one good organizing principle for your uh, you know, as you start thinking about five G, is basically we are concerned with 
a fast network and we were concerned with a very high capacity network. And one of the, one of the threat, and by capacity what I mean is a lot of bits per second, given that there's only a finite amount of spectrum. This MIMO thing, that's sort of multiple input, multiple output, basically what that means is that instead of having one transmit antenna and one receive antenna, you give yourself multiple transmit antennas and multiple receive antennas. And what that does is, you know, there's, there's many ways to exploit that. Uh, if you have only one antenna, what can happen is you can get these fades, right? The, the, uh, your antenna is kind of an isotropic radiator. You get some energy goes this way, some energy goes this way. It winds up coming back together at your receiver and canceling in a very unfortunate way. If you have you know, multiple antennas, you are immune, more immune to that fading. And that's one way to use MIMO. Another way to use MIMO is if you want to use a lot of bandwidth, rather than have one pipe take all the bandwidth, which is very, very stressful in a physical way, maybe what you do is you split that bandwidth up over several pipes. So there's lots of tricks. Um, and uh, uh, the challenge you know, for the RF hardware that the industry in some ways is confronting for the first time is that we can do all of these things today if we didn't care about our operating expenses, no. amount of the electricity that we buy, and if we didn't care, if we were willing to carry our cell phones around in backpacks. <laughs> okay. So that's the thing. Okay. There's a lot to 5G, there's a lot of uh, details, there's a lot of, of, of very sophisticated techniques, uh, and rather than kind of, kind of talk about all of them, I do want to, I want to sort of share with you sort of one organizing principle that will help you know, kind of guide you through the exploration of the side of the What I've drawn up here is, uh, and I can do this because I'm at MIT and I can draw an equation and not have everybody leave the room. Um, this is a, a kind of what's called Shannon capacity limit. Claude Shannon was a, 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 a you know, brilliant theoretician of Bell Laboratories and uh, he kind of wrote down this law, which is uh, that the capacity in bits per second is proportional to the number of MIMO paths, or the MIMO rank, is proportional to bandwidth. That's why everyone's screaming about bandwidth. You know, you might, might sort of wonder, why is everybody talking about these high bandwidth connections at a high bit rate? Well, they're related. And, uh, you know, it goes as the log of the signal noise ratio on the channel, you know, plus one. This is actually a very, very interesting, you know, kind of piece of this. What this says is that the signal to noise ratio does not need to be greater than one in order to have a connection. You can actually have, if your signal to noise ratio is, say, 0.01, that is, you have 100 times more noise than signal, according to Shannon, you can still send information. Okay. Sounds like kind of a theoretical thing, but does anybody here have a, like a Casio G-Shock watch or something that, that, that syncs to these radio towers and you know what I'm talking about? Okay, all right, okay. So, um, the question, so is that saying then the signal, or signal noise, you could actually, it seems to suggest you could have zero signal and that would still work, but I guess I misunderstood. Well, okay, okay, so zero signal means that the log of one, okay, zero. So zero. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But important limited case. I'm glad you brought it up. Right? That's a good that's a good sanity check when you're trying to try to orient yourself with these types of things, okay? Can I think of a limiting case to see whether this guy is smoking crack or not? Right? <laughs> if if the answer <laughs> I'm laughing, but that's serious, right? If, yeah. if I if I'm gonna put this up here and you, you say, Well wait, what happens if there's no signal? The answer better be zero. Thankfully it is. Oh. Okay. But if this SNR is 10 to the minus sixth, what's interesting is that the capacity is not zero. It's small, but it's not zero. And in fact, if I compensated by using a lot of bandwidth, I could do something in an extremely noisy environment. Now this, uh, this, uh, this Casio uh, G-Shock watch is just a, G-Shock is kind of a, a, a design philosophy. It's very interesting, but but uh, you know so, some of them you know will uh, they they call them sort of these these atomic clocks, but they'll they'll sync to these uh, you know, uh, timekeeping radio towers. The, the one in North America is in four columns. 
you know. And you know, it's very interesting. Like I, I, I you, you, you take your watch. Uh, you know, it, it, it only it, it's I think it's on the 60 kilohertz. You know, kind of AM band. Um, and between new between midnight and five, you know, it'll kind of pull the radio tower and kind of see why between midnight and five because that's you know the ionosphere is higher at night, you know, and you know the range of the the tower is increased. And you think, well, you know, how can you do that? I mean, the, 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 it's such a small signal, you know, from the, from the tower in Fort Collins to the third floor bedroom in our house. That can't be a lot of signal. And the answer is that it does not have to be. Because I'm, I'm practically sending you know, seconds per bit, right? I, I, I don't care how fast this comes in. All I care about, especially with a good quartz movement, is that I succeed in getting the timestamp maybe once a month, right? So that is, that is a, a very low capacity application, and therefore I don't need a lot of signal. You know, now the details are, you know, how do you get a lot of signal out of the noise? I mean, that, that's coding theory, right? That, that's, that's what, you know, your comm theory friends uh, you know, you can get them started and just make sure that you have a few beers to kind of get through the barrage that comes back. I mean, they are all over this, you know. Those are the details, but, but you know, basically what they are, uh, what they're animating, you know, is this. Okay, so if you look, if you look now at, you know, kind of 5G, what's happening? Basically, high bandwidth, you know, use a lot of channels, put them all together, a lot of spectrum, okay? You know, MIMO, N, getting it high, you know, nice linear, uh, you know, growth in capacity with the number of, of, of uh, you know, MIMO paths. SNR is a little bit tricky. You can't, you know, kind of get the, you know, temperature, the noise temperature of the universe to kind of really go down. But, you know, if you did, then you would use a higher constellation, you know, kind of digital modulation scheme. And that's, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh does this formula, is this like a theoretical limit or is this like dependent on the algorithm that converts your signal and eliminates noise? Okay. It is a theoretical limit uh, and there is nothing in this relationship that is tied to the implementation, which is a very deep observation. So let's go to what it might be missing. <coughs> So this is the classic kind of Shannon limit. And this is the Joel Dawson fudge factor. <laughs> okay. And I'm willing to actually entertain a broad definition of energy. So there's actual watts, which I tend to think about, but effort expended in coming up with the algorithms to kind of get to this, this limit. I mean, that, that is, I mean, coding theory, I mean, this is, this is how close can you get to the Shannon limit, you know? Uh, sometimes that actually has a physical energy cost in terms of computation power, you know? Uh, I've never heard of anybody apply blockchain to this, but it's early. <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it's a, and one, one, to me, the, the most amazing thing about, you know, the Shannon paper is that he's able to, you should get, it's a great example of just technical writing. It's clear, it's unpretentious. It's kind of like, you know, the, like the Feynman lectures, right? I mean, he knows a lot of math, but he, you know, he's just, it's all about clarity, you know? Um, and uh, you, able to arrive at this theoretical limit, especially knowing what we know now about all the different ways you know, to kind of get close to this limit. It's amazing that such a simple relationship could govern this, you know, given how complicated these fields are. Okay. So, I titled this, you know, kind of joking a little bit, why 5G is hard. This is why it's hard. If we, if we didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, operating expenses, if we didn't worry, have to worry about size, if we didn't have to worry about the um, fact that spectrum is a finite resource, we could do anything. We could realize all of our 5G dreams. You know, it's the practicality that makes it difficult. You know, and kind of my, my, my last observation about this is that, um, you know, when we talk about spectrum being a, uh, a finite resource, I mean, you kind of know what that means, except for, well, the electromagnetic spectrum is kind of infinite, so what do we really mean? What we, what we mean is there, there is a sweet spot for radio communications between, I would say, about you know, 500 megahertz and five gigahertz, you know, where your antennas are small enough to be portable, 
where uh, electromagnetic, wa electromagnetic waves you know, propagate in a very convenient way, like they don't get blocked by things like oxygen molecules, <laughs> for example. Uh. You know, um, that, 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 that's a, so it, there's, there's really about a decade of spectrum that's kind of optimal for these mobile communications that, that we're used to. You go much lower, like kind of down in the HF bands for, for ham radio, uh, works out great, but you know, you're also having to put you know, uh, antennas up that are kind of on the scale of buildings. You, know? you go up to millimeter wave, and you know, it's like all the disadvantages of wireless communications and none of the advantages, right? The, the, big, the big nice thing about you know, wireless communications, you can just walk around, you don't have to worry about aligning the transmitter and receiver, and it's all good. You know, millimeter waves are, you know, they, they just run into things. You know, um, and uh, they're difficult to amplify. They don't propagate well. You know, the uh, uh, you know not propagating well. That's not news. That's been true kind of since the Big Bang. <laughs> you know? uh, but that that is um, uh, you know th that's what we mean by kind of limited spectrum. But but everything when you when you're thinking about 5G, you know, kind of it, it'd be it, it's good to kind of internalize this, and then and then every every idea that you hear. Uh, you know, it's going to kind of kind of map onto this in a, in a pleasing way to help keep you oriented. Mm -hmm. All right, this is actually my last slide, and I, I you know, I, I wanted to kind of bring this uh, here because this is this is um, something you know, kind of having grown up in the MIT environment that I thought I knew and I did not really. <laughs> um, What I mean by this is, uh, so not, not exactly that no one cares. When you're when you're doing like this kind of hard tech, you know, stuff, you know, it, it's you've got you know, some new gene sequencing or some you know you know new signal processing thing or electro kind of you know whatever it is. Um, that's very impressive, and it is very impressive. And it's very fun, and that's why you're an engineer, you know. Um, but you know what you find you know, when you kind of go into the business world is that. Um, that almost has to be kind of your private entertainment. You don't get any credit for the fact that your product is very, very difficult to make. Okay. Your investors can get around to being happy about a successful venture that makes Velcro wallets just as well as they can being happy about your venture succeeding. And they'll be happier with the Velcro wallets if that gives them a 100x return. It looked like geniuses no matter what. You know, hard tech is kind of hard for a reason. It gets messy. Like two or three years in, you know, you, you, you've hit some sort of <coughs> unexpected constraint or an unexpected demand from the market uh, that requires you to kind of problem solve, you know, with Ray Stata looking over your shoulder wondering, are you going to lose his six million dollars? You know, and that's, that's, that's sort of not, uh, that's not kind of easy or not stressful for anybody. But, you know, the, the, the point being there that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, do I think that hard tech is worth doing? Absolutely. That is, that is, you know, why I became an engineer. But it'd be good if you're thinking about doing something like this, starting a company in this space, you know, understand that the, joy of doing the hard science there is you know, kind of a personal reward for you and your team. You're in your lab and you're seeing something that nobody else in the world knows is possible. That is a very precious experience you know, to kind of have. Uh, and just do not have the expectation that you will be able to share that with your investors and kind of, kind of other stakeholders. That feels bad at first, it's actually okay. But you need to know that going in. You, it, it's, uh, you, you are not going to be able to say, but this goes on for kind of five or ten years, it's just sort of losing money. You're not going to be able to say, uh, you, know, you know, this is art. You know, you should be supporting this because, you know, for the same reason that you're, you're supporting space travel. You know, that may be true, but that's not how it's going to be. And you just sort of want to, you know, kind of you know, orient yourself, you know, kind of that way. If you're going in, you know, you are going in because you love the science and you really want to make money. And you just have to switch those two when you're talking outside your head. <laughs> OK. That is all the prepared material I have. Happy to take questions, have a discussion. I think we have, a, we have the, the, the room for another kind of you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And um, you know, thank you for your time.
is on video, right? Yes. Great. Sorry. Joel, I'm Before interested in, yes. there's a layman's terms way of describing some of the uh, insights or hacks that you use to, to increase the power efficiency. So I know that the yeah. um, e department here is famous for increasing the efficiency of power conversion by yeah. increasing the frequency. Yeah. Um, is there a similar, like, high-level insight you can give us into how you... There is. Uh, oh. If we could actually bring up the screens, I could use a chalkboard, you know, we're, we're kind of... So I... I, I um, yes, there is. Um, actually... Okay. Imagine I can, I can just use this one. No, I can also say... No, we'll get it. One second. No. Are you done with your slides? I know. There we go. He's actually more interested in getting the size of the magnetics down, right. you know, and then uh, usually that carries a penalty of lowering the efficiency, and so that's the magic, right? He's that he's able to get both. Okay. Um, the, Why does your uh, power amplifier have magnetics? What's up? Why does your power amplifier have magnetics? Most power amplifiers don't. Uh, well, most yeah, power except for like filters at the end. Okay. All right, because okay, so those are two very interesting questions. Okay, uh, so uh, let me tackle the second one first. Okay, why why would your power amplifier have magnetics? Okay, one way that you can build a power amplifier is very simplified. Look, mom, no magnetics. Okay, this is what we call a space heater that also passes on. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, a class A amplifier. You know, basically, you know, when you don't when you don't use, um, and you know, there's always uh, there's parasitic capacitance that's sort of sitting out there. You know, uh, that's kind of like a safety on the universe. It's like you can't build something that's, that's perfect because then you would blow everything up. So I'm going to put set of uh, you know parasitic you know elements in here to. So uh, you know what I mean by a space heater is that you know when your when your amplifier is operating at kind of you know 800 megahertz, you know uh, <coughs> one gigahertz, you know five gigahertz, you know, that type of thing. Uh, the fact that this capacitance is here winds up hurting you more and more. You wind up having to make this resistor to make the RC time constant small. You wind up having to make the, uh, uh, the resistor smaller and smaller to get the gain up. You wind up you know, pouring current like crazy through this, current times the voltage. I mean, it just, it just all falls apart. It all falls apart, okay. But for radio, the reason that we've been able to build radios for a century and not have to wait until we get you know, sort of 90 nanometer or below transistors is that we can specialize, which is to say, I know there's some capacitance here. But if I do a little bit of magnetics, I can make that capacitor disappear at one frequency. How nice is that? Capacitance is everywhere and it's a pain. And you know, once you sort of emotionally accept that, it gets worse because it's often a nonlinear capacitor. It's just, it's, just, it's just a lot of bad news. But one thing that you can do is say, I don't need to amplify from DC to daylight. I just need this to function around a narrow band at one gigahertz. And if I know that, then I'm going to make all the bad stuff disappear at that carrier frequency. This is another kind of, you know, uh, illustrative of another big principle in engineering, which is that specialization makes the problem easier. If I'm building a car and I don't have to both have it compete 
in the Spanish Grand Prix, Prix and be my commuter car, it makes the engineering challenge a little bit easier. There need to be both a Prius and a Ferrari Roadster. Okay. Uh, if you ask any system to kind of fulfill all of those things, it's just a monster. And you know, it consumes a lot of energy. So that is why we have the magnetics. Now, um, one of the things that we do to uh, one of the things that we do to maximize the amount of information that we have, you know, in a given channel, is that we modulate the signal in both amplitude and phase. You can modulate it in amplitude, you can modulate it in phase, you can modulate it in both. We modulate it in both. Now, we're getting away from our principle of, of specializing. We just had constant env uh, envelope, we've got one envelope size, and you can maximize thing, and you have 2G. You know, and you'll recall that those phones would go like seven days without a charge. Okay, they were nice, right? Uh, but they were also kind of low capacity. We go to 3G and 4G, and now what we're, what we're saying is that uh, you know, the, the envelope is going to be sort of be modulated, okay? It gets worse. It turns out that a way to make it uh, kind of really high capacity, the statistics are such that um, you only hit the peaks of your envelope very rarely, like 0.01% of the time. Uh, and all the rest of the time, you have a supply voltage that is much higher than it needs to be, okay? If I multiply that drain voltage by my average current, I get basically the amount of energy that's being dissipated. Some of that's going out over the envelope. But you see the problem now. When we went to 3G and 4G, we want to have these big you know, uh, modulating envelope signals. And when we get to our RF uh, our lineup, we have to size it for a statistically rare event. And all the rest of the time, we're wasting energy. Okay. So uh, at Ada Devices, it is not a new idea to modulate the supply. Um, but, and in fact, you know, something called envelope tracking was what people, has been kind of a white whale of our field for a long time. You know, that winds up kind of falling apart for lots of other reasons. So, you know, kind of the, the insight behind Ada, Ada devices was um, with supply <coughs> modulation, can you make the supply modulator a lot more primitive and make up for the primitivity with signal processing. I'm having to be a little bit careful now because we're getting into Nokia IP and, and so I, I'm not trying to be cagey, but we, we, the, 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 basic, the basic principle is it is wasteful to leave the supply where it is. If you do the most intuitive thing you can think of, it looks great on paper and falls apart in implementation. And then, so the room to innovate was, well, if you do something that looks like really primitive and clunky, but you know, thank God for Moore's law, you know, kind of winds up working out. So this was a this was a this was a mixed bag for us. You know, uh, basically, uh, the the technology behind Ada devices, you know, relied on um, very sophisticated power management engineering, kind of with Dave Peralt. Uh, you know, a new kind of kind of RF engineering that was kind of my you know, specialty, and then sort of digital digital signal processing. So you know, you could say, well, you know, why did you guys get, you know, a 30% reduction in power consumption and a 50% reduction in heat compared to the state of the art? Well, you know, you wind up having to put a lot of things together to make that you know, work out. That left us in a very weak position as a business. Okay, technology is very strong, but you know, now we can't just package it in a widget and hand it off to our customers, which is what they really want. Okay, now. They have to embrace changing their whole wide up to make this work, you know. And it's even worse than that. Uh, you know, the guys that have to embrace it are the guys whose job it was to make this problem better. So now you're going to bring, you know, kind of a startup company with a couple of former professors in to kick your ass, basically, right? I mean, this, this is, you know, you know and, and you know, they're going to get the credit. I mean, it was just, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a nightmare, you know, in, in that way. That, that's, what, that's what left us kind of very weak. If we, we, could, have, if we could have found a way uh, to kind of package this so that, 
they didn't need to work with it, they didn't need to change their whole system, they could just take it and try it out. It would have been a new set of problems. That would have been a, a sort of a lot easier to copy and, the, and the, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, but it, but it made you know, kind of the, nego the business negotiations and everything kind of torturous. You know. um, <coughs> I don't know now, I'm getting more perspective as this gets kind of further in the rearview mirror. Um, you know, I don't know that, that any kind of startup company has an easy journey in this regard. Maybe this is just our particular difficulty. You know, but but uh, uh, you know, it made um, you know it was the, the, the complexity here and the necessity for you know a bunch of different fields to kind of come together was a, a, a technical strength, uh, but it made our business life difficult. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about the, you talked about the, at the beginning there was a trade-off between efficiency and information capacity. Right. And I yeah, remember the slide where you had capacity equals basics times fudge factor. And I'm wondering right. how that fudge factor depends on efficiency. Why does that trade-off exist? Right. So why the trade-off exists I do not know. That is a, uh, that is uh, It's just something I wonder about in engineering always. It just seems like that there, there's always, if you want to make you know, almost any you know, system metric, you know, no matter what it is, you can generally make your life easier by using more energy. Um, so I, I can kind of retreat into specifics here, but that is, that's not a general answer. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in this particular case, um, and you're, you're, you're right to ask, because it's not clear at all from the equation, OK? Um, Suppose that I went with a constant envelope modulation. Okay. Then I could design my RF lineup, you know, and I, I wouldn't have to modulate the supply, I wouldn't have to do anything, it gets very simple. You know. And you can make this incredibly efficient. Uh, you know, in Dave Peralt's world, incredibly efficient is like 98, 99% efficient. For RF, that, that's, we'll never get there. But you can make it like 80% efficient you know, if you do you know, make a constant envelope modulation. However, by committing to constant envelope modulation, uh, that is a fundamentally lower spectral efficiency. It's a, it's a, it's a less efficient way to code. You, have, you consume more bandwidth per bit than you would otherwise. So that's a very specific example of how the trade-off plays out. Why does nature seem to demand that we give up efficiency for greater uh, you know, information capacity, I do not know. I, I feel like uh, with you know, the, the step forward that we took with our technology, we, we at least softened that trade off, you know, but it still exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so in a project class I finished recently, I designed a PCB, I created a product, and I think it's really interesting, and I presented it to professors, and they thought it was also interesting. But really, I don't know where to go next with this idea. It's just kind of this end of the project class, and kind of pass it down. I don't really know what to take it. Okay. Um, can they hear questions from the microphone? Maybe they got a kind of So, if you come up with a new thing, <coughs> the first thing to ask yourself is, would somebody buy it? That's the first thing to ask yourself, right? I mean, I think that there's a there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of things that kind of come up, you know, kind of you know, you know is someone steal the IP? Can somebody get a copy of kind of all these things, you know, or or, or kind of operations wise, you know, uh, will they buy it for a price that's greater than I can make it? You know, those kind of things. But but you know, before you get to all of that, the first question to kind of start thinking about is. You know, have I created some value here that someone would pay for? And that's kind of a tricky question because you can't always go by what people say, right? Uh, you know, uh, Steve Jobs to me is a good example of this. You know, if, if he went around asking people, hey, would you buy an iPad? I got a phone and I got a laptop. You know, what's your problem? And yet, when the iPad shows up, it's like, this is awesome. <laughs> right? So that's not a simple question. I mean, this idea that, that, that of, uh, and you know, Apple's really good at this. I, I, I don't know how long they'll, they'll stay good at it. But you know, you know, product after product that you, know, you describe it to someone and just like, I, I don't need that. I say, basically, what I need is you know, what I already have, but cheaper and better. You know? 
And you know, they, they had a number of hits in a row where they just kind of delivered what customers needed instead of what they said they wanted. So that's a deep question to kind of think about. You know, uh, if you become convinced that you have something that people will buy, you know, then the adventure starts. You know, there's a lot of choices to make in terms of, you know, how am I going to get this thing built? You know, um, you know, how many people do I need? Do I need to raise capital to do this? You know, that kind of stuff. But that, that, that's the first question. Okay. Coming back to that fudge factor, is it a linear function of bandwidth or is it a quadratic function of bandwidth? Yeah. Who's yeah. It no, was, there's a lot of fudge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I say fudge factor, I mean fudge factor. I have no idea. You know, uh, it, it is a, um, uh, you know, what I meant by that was that, you know, and, and I think I forget who asked it, I think you asked the question whether the Shannon limit or what did, okay. Um, there is some, you have to spend some energy, you know, to kind of send bits across the wireless channel and, and you know, what form that take, you know, what variables are its inputs even, you know, it, it's, it's uh, I feel like that is a, if I were back in academia, you know, uh, that's a, it's still something I think about from time to time. And, you know, what, what, would, what would that form factor, the fudge factor actually take? The, the reason I ask is that you, know, if you compare power for the PA versus the SOC on a phone, for example, right? where would you dedicate your engineering efforts? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. It, it, it is still the PA. I mean, you do it on both. You know, the, the PA uh, is the one whose worst case heat dissipation has the biggest impact on your heat management structure. Um, you know, uh, you are right. The SOC, uh, the system on chip, basically the, the, the digital microprocessor that kind of drives things. Um, you know, as we go to kind of more and more sophisticated operation, it used to be that the PA was far and away the biggest power consumption, and the SOC has been creeping up. Uh, but you still, you still win today by, you know, focusing on the PA. You know, um, we can be a little bit lazy with the SOC just because I mean Moore's law hasn't quite run out yet, and so you know that's that's kind of helped. But but uh, you know, five G, you know, is driving up these SOC energy consumption, and that that's uh, uh, that's a fair question. Yes. So we're running low on time, so I. Don't know how long we have the room. We can stay for questions, but just want to wrap up for those online first. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, for people on campus watching online, um, just a reminder, amateur radio exams, if you're interested, are actually this evening. Um, then thank you. And thank you. And now we can go back to questions. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. I wanted to introduce you myself. I'm Robert Peterson. I'm okay. um, basically from Draper, and I actually work in there now, but I was um, the partner.